Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes, The Sign of the Fall. Chapter 1. The Science of Deduction. One afternoon, Holmes and I were chatting in our living room. When he didn't have a puzzle to solve, he often seemed unhappy. That day, he was playing with his pipe and saying he was bored. I picked up a small book from his lap, hoping to talk about something else. What do you think of my writing, Holmes? Did you read my story on a study in Scarlet? I did take a look, he said, but I can't say well done. Solving puzzles is about finding out facts, and you've added too many feelings. I felt hurt by his words. I had written it to make him happy. My writings are being turned into French, he said, not noticing my sadness. Your writings? Ah, didn't you know? He said, laughing. I've written a few short things. One talks about over a hundred types of tobacco and another one about tracking footprints. But I'm probably making you bored with my hobbies? Not at all, I said, really interested. Can I test your abilities? I'd be happy to solve any puzzle you give me, Holmes answered. I remember you saying that a person leaves signs on things they use often, I started. I took out a watch from my pocket. It wasn't you, it was mine not long ago. Could you try to understand the old owner's personality by looking at this watch? I gave him the watch, feeling a little funny. I knew this job was impossible, and I hoped to show him that he wasn't always right. He looked at the watch closely, even using his small glass. He gave it back to me with a sad look. There's not much to use, he said. The watch has been cleaned recently. Yes, you're right, I said, thinking he had failed. But I did learn something, he said, looking thoughtfully at the ceiling. The watch was your older brother's, who got it from your father. I nodded. You understood that from the age. W. On the back? Exactly. The W probably stands for your name. The watch is almost 50 years old, and these letters are just as old. So, it was likely made for the older generation. It's common for jewelry to be passed to the eldest son. Your father died a long time ago, so it's likely been with your older brother since. You're right, I admitted. Anything more? He was not careful. He had chances in life but wasted them. He mostly lived without money with short times of having money. He started drinking and finally died. That's all I can guess. I was shocked. Holmes, I can't believe you. You've been asking about my late brother, and now you're pretending to know this all from his old watch. My dear friend, he said gently, I'm sorry if I hurt you. But I didn't even know you had a brother until you showed me this watch. Then how did you know all this? You're exactly right. Did you just guess? No, I don't guess. You find it strange because you don't follow my thinking or see the small signs that guide my guessing. Firstly, the watch case is full of marks. It means your brother kept hard items, like coins or keys, in the same pocket. A man who treats a costly watch like that must be careless. Furthermore, there are several numbers inside the case, suggesting he often had money problems lastly. The worn-out hole for the key shows signs of heavy drinking. All of these signs together give a clear picture. It's clear now, I agreed. I'm sorry for not trusting you. It's a pity you don't have a puzzle to solve right now. Are you enjoying this story? Let us know by tapping the like button. Thank you. Chapter 2. The Statement of the Case The next morning, we were disturbed by a loud knock. Our housekeeper walked in with a visitor's card. A young lady wishes to see you, sir, she told Holmes. Miss Mary Mawson, 
He read from the card and asked the lady to join us. Miss Morrison entered with confidence. She was a young blonde lady, dressed neatly. Her simple beige dress and a hat with one white feather looked good on her. She had a lovely face with friendly blue eyes. But underneath her calm look, I could tell she was worried. I need your help, Mr. Holmes, she began, a voice slightly shaky. Holmes looked eager. Please share everything, he said. Feeling a bit awkward, I tried to leave. But to my surprise, she asked me to stay. My dad was in the Indian Army, she started. He sent me back to Britain when I was a child. My mom was no more, and I had no family here. I stayed in a school in Edinburgh until I was 17. In 1878, my dad returned to England. He sent me a message saying he was at the Langham Hotel in London. I hurried there, only to find he was missing. I waited and called the police, but he never came back. The date? Holmes asked, taking down notes. He went missing on December 3, 1878. About ten years ago. His belongings? Left at the hotel. There were some books, clothes, and strange items from the Andaman Islands. He used to work there with the prisoners. Any friends in London? Only one that I know, Major Sholto, from his regiment. He had retired earlier and lived in Upper Norwood. He didn't even know my dad was back. An interesting case, thought Holmes. But there's more, she said. In May 1882, an advert appeared in the Times newspaper asking for my address. That day, I received a pearl in the mail. And every year, I receive a similar pearl on the same day. This morning, I got a letter. It asked me to meet at the Lyceum Theatre at seven o'clock and told me to bring two friends but not the police. It claimed that I had been wronged and promised to make things right. What a puzzle. Miss Morstan, what will you do? I need your advice on this. We will certainly go. Dr. Watson can join us. We've solved mysteries together before. I'd be glad to join, I said. Thank you both, she said. I have no one else to ask. Should I come here at six? Exactly at six, answered Holmes. May I see the pearl box? He checked the note in the box. The person sending you these pearls and letters has changed their handwriting. It's not your dad's writing, right? It's nothing like it. Thank you, Miss Morstan. We'll be here at six. She thanked us and left. I watched her from the window as she walked away, her grey hat and white feather fading into the crowd. Chapter 3. In Quest of a Solution Isn't she a beautiful lady? I remarked enthusiastically. Holmes had started his pipe and was relaxing in his chair. Did she? I didn't notice. He responded. You're quite a character. I exclaimed, a bit frustrated. He smiled kindly. It's crucial not to let personal charm cloud our judgment. The most pleasant woman I ever met was punished for poisoning three kids for their money, he added. But this situation? I don't make exceptions. Ever studied handwriting? What do you think about this note? He asked, changing the subject. It looks clean, I offered after a brief glance. Holmes shook his head, got up and said, I'll be back in an hour. I acknowledged him, but my thoughts were on our guest, her smile, her voice, the peculiar mystery around her. She must be twenty-seven now if she was seventeen when her father vanished. A tender age. I sensed a growing affection for her and quickly diverted myself to reading some medical journals. Holmes was back around half past five. He was in high spirits. Mrs. Hudson had served us tea, and I poured him a cup. This isn't a big mystery, he said, accepting the tea and joining me at the table. 
All signs point to one explanation. Have you solved it already? I asked, surprised. Well, not entirely. But I've uncovered a vital piece of information. I went through the Times old editions and discovered that Major Sholto died on April 28, 1882. I might be missing something, Holmes, but I can't see what this implies. Holmes looked surprised. Really? Consider this. Captain Mawson goes missing. The only person he could have visited in London was Major Sholto, who denied seeing him. Four years later, Sholto dies. Within a week, Captain Morstan's daughter starts receiving valuable gifts annually. Now, she receives a letter calling her a wronged woman. What wrong could it be? Her father's disappearance? And why would these gifts start right after Sholto's death unless his heir knows something about the mystery and wants to correct it? That's a strange way to right a wrong, I remarked. And why would he write a letter now and not six years ago? And what justice? Could her father still be alive? We will find out tonight, said Holmes, rising and moving to the window. Ah, here is the cab with Miss Morstan. Are you ready? Grab your coat and hat, and don't forget your revolver. I picked up my things and followed Holmes. Miss Morstan was dressed in a dark cloak. Her face was pale but composed. She must have felt some anxiety, but she hid it well. Major Sholto was close to my father, she replied to Holmes' question. Dad often mentioned him in his letters. They both served together in the Andaman Islands. She then handed Holmes a curious paper from her bag, which seemed to be a layout of a large building with many corridors and bore a strange mark. Holmes studied it and said, this could be significant. Keep it safe, Miss Morstan. We drove through the foggy city streets towards the Lyceum Theatre, discussing softly while Holmes occasionally made notes in his notebook. The fog and the dim shop lights created an eerie atmosphere, making us feel a bit anxious. Once at the theatre, a man dressed as a coachman confirmed our identities and asked Miss Morstan to assure him that we were not police officers. After she did, he signaled a cab, and we hopped in. With a quick whip, the horse galloped, and we began our frantic journey through the foggy streets. Don't miss a single chapter of our extraordinary stories. Hit the subscribe button now. Chapter 4. The Story of the Bald-Headed Man I thought I knew London well, but I was lost as we moved farther from the centre. Holmes, though, knew exactly where we were. He mumbled the names of the streets as our cab rattled along. We crossed the river on Vauxhall Bridge and then moved into less fancy areas. Finally, our cab stopped at a lonely house in a row of dark, empty houses. Only one window in this house showed a light. A man in a white outfit and yellow head wrap opened the door for us. Inside, we were led down a dim hallway to a brightly lit room. In the room was a small man with a band of red hair, a shiny bald spot in the middle. He was a bundle of nerves, one minute wringing his hands, the next, smiling. Hello, Miss Morstan and gentlemen, he said in a high, squeaky voice. Emphatious shoulder. Please, come in. His room was full of strange decorations, tiger skins on the floor and a dove-shaped lamp hanging from the ceiling. Mr. Sholto started to talk about art, but Miss Morstan interrupted him. We're here to hear your story, Mr. Sholto, she said. Please, tell us what we need to know. Of course, Miss Morstan, he said. We need to go to Norwood to meet my brother, Bartholomew. He's not happy that I contacted you. Before we go, I want to explain everything to you. Sholto then told about his father, Major John Sholto, who had made a fortune in India and retired to live in Norwood. He had two twin sons, 
Thaddeus and Bartholomew. The Schultos knew about Captain Morstan's disappearance, but they never guessed their father knew what had happened. Thaddeus Schulto went on. We knew our father had a secret. He was scared to go out alone and always had two boxes acting as guards at Pondicherry Lodge. He was also scared of men with wooden legs. He once shot at a man with a wooden leg, who turned out to be a harmless worker. In 1882, our father got a letter from India that made him sick, Sholto said. On his deathbed, he confessed to us that he had kept half of a great treasure that should have belonged to Miss Morstan. He felt guilty and wanted us to give her a fair share after he died. He also told us what happened to your father, Sholto said, looking at Miss Morstan. Your father came to claim his share of the treasure that day. He had a weak heart. He and my father argued about how to split it. Morstan jumped up in anger but then grabbed his side, fell backwards, hit his head, and died. Chapter 5 The Tragedy of Pondicherry Lodge Miss Morstan's eyes filled with tears, and I gave her my cloth to dry them. Sholto then stopped his story for a short while. My dad was very worried. People could think he had killed Captain Morstan. The argument and the cut on Morstan's head could make it seem so, and he couldn't tell them what they were arguing about. His servant walked in just then and, thinking my dad was guilty, offered to get rid of the body. When dad finished telling us this terrible story, he started to tell us where the treasure was hidden. But suddenly, he looked very scared. Keep him out. Please, keep him out. He shouted. We both turned to look at the window and saw a face pressed against the glass. It was a face covered in hair, with crazy eyes and a very mean expression. My brother and I ran to the window, but the man had disappeared. When we looked back at my dad, he was dead. Sholto caught his breath before continuing. We looked everywhere in the garden but found no signs that anyone had been there, except for a single footprint under the window. The next day, we saw that someone had forced their way into my dad's room, but strangely, nothing had been taken. A mysterious note was pinned to his chest that read, The Sign of the Fall. It didn't make any sense to us, and it's still a puzzle. My brother and I were excited about the treasure, Sholto continued. We searched everywhere in the garden for months, but we couldn't find it. Just as Dad was about to tell us where it was, he died. We did have a string of pearls though, and I convinced my brother that we should give them to Miss Morstan so she would still benefit. That was very kind, said Miss Morstan. Sholto shrugged. It was the right thing to do. Anyway, my brother and I disagreed about it, and I decided to move out. But yesterday, I found out that the treasure has been found. Now we just have to go and ask for our share. We won't be very welcome, but they are expecting us. Holmes was the first to stand up. Well done, sir. You might help us understand things that you don't even know about. But it's late. Let's go right now. As we drove along, Sholto kept talking. My brother is very clever. He figured out that the treasure must be hidden somewhere in the house. He measured the house and found a space that didn't appear on the plans. He made a hole in the ceiling of a bedroom and found a hidden attic. In the middle of the attic was a treasure chest. He brought it down into his room. He thinks the jewels are worth over half a million pounds. When we heard this huge amount, we were all very surprised. Miss Morstan was about to become one of the wealthiest women in the country. I should have been delighted for her, but instead, I felt a pang of regret. The wealth seemed to create a distance between us. Sholto chatted away for the rest of the trip, and I was relieved when we finally arrived. Welcome to Pondicherry Lodge, Miss Morstan, Mr. Thaddeus Sholto said as he helped her out of the cab. It was nearing eleven o'clock, 
and the sky was filled with dense clouds. The moon was hidden behind them. Thaddeus Sholto grabbed a lamp from the carriage to light our path, and we headed towards the iron door of the house, enclosed by a high wall covered in shards of glass. He knocked on the door. Who's there? A gruff voice echoed from inside. It's me, McMurdo. There was the jingle of keys, and then the heavy door creaked open. A stocky, strong man stood in the doorway. I can let you in, but I haven't been told about these other folks, he said gruffly. But I informed my brother last night that I would bring friends. I haven't been told. The young lady can't be out here at this hour. Apologies, Mr. Thaddeus, a man grumbled. I only do what him told. I don't know your friends. But you do know me, McMurdo, Holmes interjected. Remember the boxing match four years ago? Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the man exclaimed. I didn't recognize you. That punch of yours was unforgettable. Holmes chuckled. See, Watson, I always have boxing to fall back on. Come in, sir, and your friends too, the man said, stepping aside. We walked across a yard towards the big house. The whole building was dark, apart from one attic window touched by moonlight. The spooky silence was scary. I can't figure it out, Sholto said. I told Bartholomew we were coming, but there's no light. The lamp trembled in his hand. I see a bit of light in that small window next to the door Holmes pointed out. That's the housemaid's room. Can you wait here a bit? Suddenly, we heard a sad, high-pitched cry. Miss Morstan grabbed my wrist, and we all listened, hearts pounding. That's Mrs. Bernstone, said Sholto. Stay here. He quickly walked towards the door, and a tall lady let him in. Mr. Thaddeus, sir, I'm so relieved you're here. Then the door shut, and all was quiet. Sholto had left us his lamp. Holmes carefully looked around with it, checking the area. Miss Morstan and I stood together, our hands meeting. Love is so strange. Even though we had just met that day, we found comfort in each other in this scary moment. What a weird place. Miss Morstan said. Looks like a wild garden. Treasure seekers have been here, Holmes whispered. Remember, they searched for six years. Suddenly, the house door flew open, and Thaddeus Sholto ran out, eyes wide with fear. Something's wrong with Bartholomew. He shouted. Let's go inside, Holmes commanded. We followed him into the housemaid's room. The old woman paced back and forth, worried. Thank God you're here, she cried. It's been a horrible day, and now the master has locked himself in. I felt something was wrong, and I peeped through the keyhole. You must see for yourself, Mr. Thaddeus. I've never seen Mr. Bartholomew look like this. Miss Morstan stayed with the scared woman. Holmes took the lamp and led the way. Sholto was so upset that I had to help him upstairs. Once we reached the third floor, Holmes slowly moved down the hallway, and we followed him. He knocked on the door and tried to open it, but it was locked from the inside. He kneeled to look through the keyhole, then suddenly gasped and stood up. This is bad, Watson. I looked through and jumped back in shock. The moonlight showed a person sitting in a chair with a weird smile. I realized it was Thaddeus' twin brother. This is awful, I shouted. What do we do? We have to break the door, Holmes said. We both pushed against it until it broke open. Inside, the room looked like a science lab with burners, tubes, and acid containers. One container had spilt, and a strange smelling liquid was dripping onto the floor. There were steps near a hole in the ceiling, and a rope was piled nearby. Sholto's brother hadn't moved, he was dead. A strange tool was next to him, a brown stick with a stone head tied with rough string. Beside it was a ripped piece of paper with some words written on it. 
Holmes looked at it and handed it to me. My heart pounded as I read in the lantern light, the sign of the fall. Chapter 6. Sherlock Holmes gives a demonstration. What does this mean? I asked. It suggests murder, replied Holmes, examining the body. Ah, look here. He pointed at a dark thing stuck near Bartholomew's ear. It appears like a thorn, I noted. Indeed, it's a thorn. Please take it out but be cautious. It's poisoned. I carefully did as instructed and wrapped it in my handkerchief. This is also puzzling to me and it's getting more confusing. Actually, Holmes retorted, it's becoming clearer to me. Just a few more clues and the case will be solved. Our companion, Sholto, who had been quiet, suddenly cried out, the treasure is missing. I was the last to see him. I left him here last night and heard him lock the door. What time was that? It was ten o'clock. Now he's dead. The police will be called and they'll suspect me. Would I have brought you here if I were guilty? Oh no. Oh no. You shouldn't worry, Mr. Sholto. Holmes reassured him. Drive to the police station and report this. We'll wait here until you return. Dazed, the little man obeyed and we heard him stumbling down the stairs. Let's make the best of our time, Watson, said Holmes. My case is nearly solved, but I mustn't get too sure. This may be more complex than it appears. How could they have entered? He pondered. The door hasn't been opened since last night. What about the window? He examined it and said, it's shut from the inside. The window is solid. Look, someone has come in through the window. Here's a footprint on the sill, and here's a round, muddy mark, and here again on the floor, and again by the table. That's not a footprint, I said, puzzled. It's something more valuable. It's the mark of a wooden leg. The wooden-legged man? Exactly. But there's also someone else, someone very able and agile. Could you climb that wall, doctor? He asked. We were high above the ground and I couldn't see any way of climbing the brickwork. It's absolutely impossible. But if you had a friend up here who lowered you a good strong rope, like that one there on the floor, then you could climb up, wooden leg and all. You would leave the same way, and your friend would close the window and leave as he came. Also, our wooden-legged friend was not a sailor. My magnifying glass shows blood on the rope from his rapid descent, which hurt his hands. What about this mysterious friend? I asked. How did he enter? Did he come down the chimney? Holmes shook his head. It's too small. As I always say, whatever remains, however unlikely, must be the truth when you have removed the impossible. What else is there? He came through the hole in the roof. I exclaimed. Exactly. If you could hold the lamp for me, we'll continue our investigation in the room above. After climbing into the attic, he held the lamp while I followed. Upon further examination, Holmes found a trapdoor leading onto the roof, confirming the entrance of our mysterious visitor. Moreover, he discovered the prints of a barefoot much smaller than a man's. A child has done this? I asked, puzzled. Irritation flashed across Holmes' face. Let's go down. I'll explain my theory about the footprints, he said. We returned to the bedroom, and Holmes began examining the room meticulously. While we were talking, we heard heavy steps and loud voices from below. Holmes promptly asked me to examine the strange expression on the victim's face. Death by a potent poison, I said. That's why I looked for a clue immediately when I entered the room. Do you have that thorn? He asked. I presented the thorn. It was long, sharp, and had some sticky substance on the tip. Is it an English thorn? Holmes asked, 
already knowing my answer. No, it's not, I replied. Just then, a birdie man with gray hair walked heavily into the room. This was Athelney Jones, a police officer. He boomed, why, the house is as busy as a rabbit warren. I believe you know me, Mr. Athelney Jones, Holmes said quietly. Indeed, I do. You helped us with the Bishop's Gate jewelry case. But you must admit it was more luck than guidance. It was straightforward reasoning. Jones then turned his attention to the scene of the crime. His quick analysis led him to suspect Thaddeus Sholto of the murder. However, Holmes disagreed, introducing the name of the suspect, Jonathan Small, a middle-aged, sunburned man with a wooden leg. And the other man? Sneered Jones. Hopefully, I'll be able to introduce you to them both soon. Holmes asked me to escort Miss Morstan home and fetch a dog named Toby, whose sense of smell would be invaluable to our investigation. As I left, Holmes said he would see what he could learn from Mrs. Burnstone and the servant. Chapter 7. The Episode of the Barrel The coppers arrived with a taxi, and I took Miss Morstan home in it. She had been supporting the housekeeper but broke down in the taxi. I wanted to comfort her, but I restrained myself. She had been through a lot and needed time to get over it. Also, she was about to be wealthy, and I was just a poor doctor with a minor injury. The treasure seemed to create a gap between us. We arrived at Mrs. Forrester's place around 2 a.m. Despite the late hour, Mrs. Forrester warmly welcomed Miss Morstan, treating her more like a friend than a paid teacher. I told them I'd keep them updated and left. Pinchin Lane in Lambeth was lined with run-down brick houses. At number three, I had to knock quite a bit before someone responded. A man refused to unleash his dogs, but his attitude changed when I mentioned Sherlock Holmes. The man, Mr. Sherman, was tall and lean, with stooped shoulders and blue-tinted glasses. Sherman led me to Toby, a mixed-breed dog with long hair and floppy ears. Toby hesitated at first but then willingly followed me to the cab. Back at Pondicherry Lodge, Holmes was waiting. He asked me to leave the dog and come upstairs. There, in the attic, he pointed out the footprints, which looked like they belonged to a woman or child. But what was strange was the separate toe prints. Holmes also pointed out a tar-like smell near the attic exit, which Toby would track. Holmes, perched on the roof, followed the clues left by the criminal. After some effort, he came down, holding a pouch with thorns similar to the one we found on Bartholomew Sholto's head. Ready for a long walk, Watson? Holmes asked. I agreed, even though it surprised me. This mystery was keeping me on my toes. Holmes introduced Toby to the scent of the tar and led him to the barrel. Toby quickly picked up the trail. The dog stopped at a point where several bricks were loose in the boundary wall. Holmes climbed up, took Toby from me and dropped him on the other side. The scent is strong, Holmes said. Despite their time advantage, Toby should be able to track them down. As Toby followed the scent, I asked Holmes how he was so sure about the wooden-legged man. He explained that it was quite simple. Two prison officers discover a treasure with the help of a map drawn by an Englishman named Jonathan Small. Jonathan and his mates were prisoners, so they couldn't retrieve the treasure. Major Schulter brought it back to England. When Jonathan was free or escaped, he came to England to claim his share. Hence the wooden-legged man was Jonathan Small. Holmes suggested that Jonathan Small might have had an assistant who accidentally stepped into the tar, leaving a trail. He reasoned that Jonathan wouldn't have wanted to harm Bartholomew Schulter. However, the Ozendart killed him. He concluded that Jonathan, who must now be middle-aged and sunburned after his time in the Andaman Islands, 
lowered the treasure chest and escaped. Regarding the assistant, Holmes simply said there was no mystery. Then, very seriously, he asked me if I had my gun. I said yes, hoping I wouldn't have to use it. We'd come to the city's edge. Workers and dock hands were starting their day. Despite other dogs around, Toby stayed focused on his task, sniffing the ground. Soon, we were in the middle of London. At a place called Mars Place, Toby started running back and forth, seeming unsure. He walked in circles, glancing at us like he needed help. Why is the dog acting strange? Holmes sounded annoyed. They surely wouldn't have used a taxi or flown in a balloon. Maybe they waited here for a bit. Looks like he's back on track. Toby was sniffing even more now, shown by his faster pace. We had to run to keep up, and I found it funny that Sherlock Holmes was finding it hard to keep pace for once. Finally, we arrived in a wood yard at a place called Nine Elms, where people were already working. Toby raced through the sawdust, down a small path, between two piles of wood, and jumped onto a big barrel with a happy bark. Toby, breathing heavy, looked at us. The barrel was covered with a dark liquid and the air was filled with a strong smell of something called creosote. Holmes and I laughed. Holmes helped Toby down from the barrel. Thinking about how much creosote has moved around London every day, it's not surprising our trail got mixed up. It seems what confused Toby at Miles Place were two different paths, I said. We took Toby back to the place where he seemed unsure. He sniffed around a bit before running off in a new direction. We should make sure he doesn't lead us to where the creosote barrel came from, I said. I've thought about that. But look that he's staying on the sidewalk. The barrel passed along the road. We're on the correct path again. We move towards the river. At the end of a street called Broad Street, the trail led directly to a small wooden dock by the water. Toby stood there, making small noises, looking out at the water. We've hit a problem, said Holmes. They must have used a boat from here. Close by, a small house displayed a sign, Mordecai Smith, boats for rent by the hour all day. Another sign said a steam launch was available. These people are smarter than I thought, Holmes sighed. Just then, the door opened, and a young boy ran out, followed by a red-faced woman holding a big sponge. Come back and clean up, Jack. Your dad will be upset if he sees you this dirty. What an active boy, said Holmes. Now, Jack, is there something you'd like? The boy thought a bit. A coin he said. Here you go. Catch. What a great child, Mrs. Smith. Thank you, sir. He's a lot of work, especially when my husband's not here. Gone, is he? Holmes sounded disappointed. That's unfortunate. I wanted to talk to Mr. Smith. He's been gone since yesterday. I'm starting to worry. I wanted to rent his steamboat. Interestingly, that's exactly where he's gone. But there's not enough fuel for a long trip. He could have bought more fuel. I doubt it. Also, I don't trust that man with a wooden leg. A man with a wooden leg? He came around three in the morning. He's visited before. How can you be sure it was him? I recognize his voice. He woke my husband, and they left. I heard the wooden leg making noises on the stones. What's the boat's name? The Aurora. She's not the old green boat? No, she's been freshly painted, black with two red lines. The chimney is black with a white band. Thank you. If I see Mr. Smith, I'll tell him you're worried. Good morning, Mrs. Smith. Holmes and I then cross the river on a ferry. Let's rest and get ready for tonight. We'll keep Toby. He might still be of use. Taxi, stop at a post office, please. We stopped at a post office on Great Peter Street, 
and Holmes sent a telegram. Yes, who that was for? He asked. I have no idea. Remember the kids from Baker Street from the Jefferson Hope case? I nodded, smiling. This is exactly the type of case where they can help. That telegram was to a kid named Wiggins. I expect he and his friends will join us after breakfast. It was nearly nine in the morning now, so I was tired, and my leg was hurting. My only interest in the case now was the treasure. Part of it belonged to Miss Morstan, and I was ready to do whatever it took to recover it for her, even if that meant she would forever be out of my reach. Chapter 8 The Baker Street Irregulars A good wash and new clothes made me feel much better. I went downstairs and found Holmes making our breakfast. Look at this, he said, giving me a newspaper and laughing. The paper had a short story about a mystery where a man named Bartholomew Sholto was found dead. It said that his house had been robbed and that Sherlock Holmes and I were there when it was found. A detective named Mr. Athelney Jones had quickly arrested some people in the house, including the dead man's brother, Thaddeus. Holmes seemed amused by the whole thing. I said that we were lucky not to be arrested ourselves. Holmes agreed and hoped Jones wouldn't push his luck too far. Just then, our doorbell rang loudly, and I could hear Mrs. Hudson's voice filled with surprise. Holmes, I think they might be here for us, I said. Holmes told me it was actually his unofficial team, the Baker Street Irregulars, a group of street kids he often used. A bunch of kids ran in, lined up and faced us. The oldest one stepped forward. We got your message, sir. Brought everyone as fast as I could. Holmes paid them and gave them a task, to find a boat named the Aurora owned by a man named Mordecai Smith. He described the boat and told one of the kids to watch Mordecai Smith's place. The rest were to search the riverbanks. He promised them a coin, if they found the boat. Holmes believed in their abilities. He expected news by night. He told me he wasn't tired, but that he needed to think about our case. He talked about a man with a wooden leg and another odd character. He grabbed a book and started to read about a tribe that used blowpipes. We wondered how these two odd people could have met. Holmes suggested I take a nap while he thought about the case. I lay on the sofa while he played a calming tune on his violin. His music sent me off to sleep, and I dreamt of Mary Morstan. When I woke up, Holmes was still in his chair, reading. I asked about any news, but he said there was none yet. He suggested I visit Mrs. Forrester and Miss Morstan. I did as he suggested, visiting Mrs. Forrester and Miss Morstan. I told them about Mr. Sholto's death, but didn't tell them all the bad details. Mrs. Forrester and Miss Morstan were both very curious about the story. Miss Morstan didn't seem interested in the treasure, though. She seemed more worried about Thaddeus Sholto. I got back to Baker Street in the evening. Mrs. Hudson told me that Holmes had been acting strangely, walking up and down. I reassured her, saying it was just a small problem on his mind. I could hear Holmes walking around throughout the night. The next morning at breakfast, he looked tired and told me that he hadn't slept at all. He was frustrated with the lack of news about the boat. We spent the day waiting, but there was no news. The papers said that the investigation would take place the next day. Chapter 9 A Break in the Chain One early morning, I was startled awake to see Holmes by my side, looking like a sailor. He had on a heavy warm jacket and a rough red scarf. I'm going to explore down the river, Watson. Can you stay here and look after any messages? He asked. I'm not sure where I'll go, but I'll try to come back soon. Sure, Holmes, I responded. 
eating my breakfast, I read some new info in the standard paper. It reported that the upper Norwood puzzle might be trickier than we thought. The police now thought that Thaddeus Sholto and his housekeeper didn't do anything wrong, so they let them go. The paper hinted that they might arrest more people soon. I started to wonder about this new hint. Then, I saw a news report about a man named Mordecai Smith and his son Jim who were gone. They had left on a boat named Aurora. A reward was being given to anyone who knew where they were. I realized Holmes had set this up. It was clever, as the people Holmes was after would think it was a worried wife looking for her husband. Time seemed to move slowly. Every noise made me think Holmes was back. I tried to read, but my mind kept drifting. Then our doorbell rang loudly, and a man named Mr. Athelney Jones walked in. He looked different, more modest and sorry than before. Hi, sir, he said. Is Mr. Sherlock Holmes here? No and I don't know when he'll be back, I answered. Do you want to wait? Can I get you a drink? Well, just a small one. You see, I had to change my mind about the Norwood case. Sholto proved he wasn't alone. I'm worried about how people see me, and I could use some help. We all need help sometimes, I told him. Then, we heard heavy steps on the stairs, and a man who looked old and tired came in. He asked for Holmes. When I told him Holmes wasn't here, he said he knew something about Mordecai Smith's boat, but he would only tell Holmes. Jones tried to stop him from leaving, telling him he must stay until Holmes came back. Suddenly, Holmes showed up, revealing he was the old man all along. I've been working undercover all day, Holmes said. A lot of criminals know me now, so I need to hide my identity. He then asked Jones to arrange for a fast police boat by 7 o'clock in the evening. He also wanted two men for backup. And he wanted me to be the one to give the treasure to Miss Morstan. Jones agreed but said we would have to give the treasure to the police later. Holmes also asked to speak with Jonathan Small, the man they were chasing. Jones agreed to this too. Finally, Holmes asked Jones to join us for dinner. Chapter 10. The End of the Islander Our dinner was lively. Holmes was very talkative that night. He seemed full of energy. I had never seen him so lively before. He talked about many things like old pottery, Stradivarius violins, future warships. He seemed to know about everything. Athelney Jones was also very friendly. I was happy because we were almost done with our work. After dinner Holmes checked the time, filled three glasses with sweet wine, and made a toast to our success. He said it was time for us to leave. He told me to bring my gun, and he would bring his. He said we should be ready for anything. A taxi was already waiting for us. Just after seven, we got to Westminster Wharf, where our boat was waiting. Holmes looked at it carefully. Does this boat look like a police boat? He asked. Yes, it has a green light on the side, someone answered. Then remove it. After the light was removed, we got on the boat. Holmes, Jones and I sat at the back. There was one man steering the boat, one looking after the engines, and two strong police inspectors at the front. Where are we going? Jones asked. To the tower. Tell them to stop near Jacobson's yard. Holmes was pleased as we went faster than a riverboat. We should be able to catch anything on the river, he said. I asked him how he found the Aurora. He told us how he figured out that Jonathan Small and his helper must have hidden their boat but kept it ready for a quick escape. So, he dressed up as a sailor and asked at all the yards along the river. At Jacobson's yard, he found out the Aurora had been brought there for some unnecessary repairs. Then, Mordecai Smith showed up, 
acting drunk and loudly demanding his boat at eight that night. He seemed to have a lot of money. Holmes followed him for a bit, then went back to the yard and had one of his men keep watch over the Aurora. Jones suggested we should have arrested them at the yard, but Holmes said that would have been a mistake. Small was smart. He would have sent someone to check first and if something seemed off, he would have waited another week before making a move. As we were going past the city, the sun was just setting over St. Paul's. It was twilight when we reached the tower. That's Jacobson's yard, said Holmes, pointing to a bunch of masts and rigging on the south bank. He took out binoculars and looked at the shore. I can see my man on watch, he said, but no sign of the handkerchief. Suddenly, he became alert. Do I see a handkerchief? Isn't that a white flutter over there? Yes, that's your man. I shouted. I can see him. And there's the Aurora. Holmes exclaimed. And she's moving fast. Full speed ahead, engineer. Go after that boat with the yellow light. I'll be very upset if we can't catch her. The Aurora had slipped out of the yard and was already moving fast. Jones looked worried. She's very fast, he said. I don't think we can catch her. We must catch her. Holmes cried. We were moving very fast too. We passed other boats quickly. People were shouting at us from the dark, but the Aurora kept going fast, and we kept following her. We're getting closer, said Jones. I think so too, I said. We'll catch up with her soon. Jones turned a bright light on her, and we could see people on her deck. One man was sitting at the back with something black between his knees. Next to him was a dark mass. A boy was steering the boat, and we could see Old Smith. Slowly, we started to catch up. In the quiet night, we could hear their boat's engines. We were very close now. Jones shouted at them to stop. Hearing him, the man at the back stood up and shook his fists at us. He was shouting angrily. He was a strong man, and I could see that from his right thigh down, he had a wooden leg. Suddenly, the man took out a short piece of wood from under his blanket and put it to his lips. We need to be ready with our guns, said Holmes. If he raises his hand, shoot. We fired our guns. The man spun around, threw up his hands, and fell sideways into the river. I caught one glimpse of his furious eyes before they disappeared in the white water. At the same time, the wooden-legged man steered his boat straight for the south bank. We tried to follow, but they were almost at the bank. It was a quiet and lonely place, with moonlight shining on pools of still water. The aurora ran onto a mud bank with a dull thud. The man jumped out but his wooden leg sunk deep into the mud. He yelled in anger and kicked with his good foot, but he only sunk deeper into the soft ground. We brought our boat up to the shore and threw a rope around his shoulders. Then we were able to pull him out over the side of our boat like a big, bad fish. The smiths, father and son, sat glumly in their boat but obeyed us when asked. We moved the aurora, their ship, away from the shore and attached it to our boat. A heavy box from India was on their deck, and I figured it could be the treasure. The box was locked but heavy, so we slowly moved it to our small room. As we went slowly up the river, we shone our light everywhere, but Small's helper was nowhere to be found. Check this out, Holmes pointed. A dangerous dart was stuck close to where we had been. It must have barely missed us when we shot our guns. Holmes only smiled and shrugged, but the thought of the close call made me feel sick. Our captive sat across from the iron box. He had a tanned, lined face, a big beard, and was likely about fifty, with his black hair going grey. His face was not mean, but his heavy eyebrows made him look scary when he was mad. With his hands cuffed, 
he sat gazing at the box. He looked more upset than angry, and I thought I saw a spark of fun in his eyes when he looked at me. Well, Jonathan Small, Holmes started, lighting a cigar. It's a shame things ended up this way. I agree, he replied. And I swear I didn't hurt Mr. Sholto. It was Tonga who shot him. I wasn't involved. But how could Tonga control Mr. Sholto while you were climbing? Holmes queried. You seem to know everything, sir. I was hoping the room would be empty. Mr. Sholto usually had dinner at that time. I regret his death. I had no issues with him, only with his father. Mr. Athelney Jones of Scotland Yard will deal with you. He'll take you to my place and you'll explain everything. You must be honest. Then, I hope I can help you. I believe I can prove that the poison was so fast acting that Mr. Sholto was dead before you entered the room. Yes, he was, sir. I was shocked when I saw him as I climbed in through the window. I would have chased Tonga but he ran away, leaving his club and darts behind. I think that led you to us. I don't hate you, but it's strange that I, who could claim a fortune, spent half of my life building a sea wall in the Andaman Islands, and the other half in a jail. Seeing the Agra treasure for the first time was a bad day for me. It's been a curse for everyone who owned it. It brought fear and guilt to Major Sholto, and to me, it meant jail. Just then, Athelney Jones pushed his way into the room. A gathering, he remarked. We should celebrate. Holmes, you cut it pretty close. It was quite the chase. All ends well, said Holmes. But I didn't realize the Aurora was that fast. Smith says it's one of the quickest boats on the river. If he had helped with the engines, we wouldn't have caught them. He insists he didn't know anything about Norwood. He didn't, cried our captive. I picked his boat because I heard it was fast. We didn't tell him anything but paid him well. If he's innocent, he won't be harmed. We're quick at catching people but don't judge them hastily. Jones seemed pleased with his achievement. I had to stifle my laughter. Holmes' smile showed he found it amusing too. We'll be at Vauxhall Bridge soon, Jones said, and I'll let you off, Dr. Watson, with the treasure box. I'm taking a risk doing this. It's unusual, but a promise is a promise. However, I have to send a cop with you, considering the worth of the treasure. Shame there's no key, so we can't make a list of contents. You'll have to break it open. Where's the key? At the river's bottom, Small answered. You've made things harder for us. Doctor, be careful. Bring the box to Baker Street. We'll meet you there, on our way to the station. An officer and I arrived at Mrs. Forrester's place with the box. The house worker was surprised by our late visit but told me Miss Morstan was waiting in the sitting room. I stepped in with the box. The officer stayed with the car. Miss Morstan was sitting near an open window, lit by a gentle lamp. Hearing me, she quickly stood up, her face brightened with surprise and joy. I heard a car but never imagined it could be you. What news do you bring? She asked. I bring something better than news, I replied, putting the box on the table. I bring a fortune. She looked at the iron box. Is that the treasure? Yes, this is the Agra treasure. Half is yours, and the other half is for Thaddeus Sholto. You'll be very wealthy. Isn't it wonderful? I think I sounded too excited because she looked at me oddly. If I have, it's thanks to you. No, to me, but to my friend Sherlock Holmes. I couldn't have solved a puzzle that even he struggled with. We nearly lost it at the last moment. She asked me to sit and explain what happened. I told her about our recent adventures, Holmes' disguise, our evening trip, and the wild boat chase. She listened eagerly. When I told her about the dart that barely missed us, she went pale, and I feared she might faint. 
It's just a shock to hear that I put my friends in such danger, she said. Let's focus on something happy, like the treasure, I said. Wouldn't you like to be the first to see it? It would be very interesting, she said, but she sounded a bit distant. This is a beautiful box, and it's so heavy. Where's the key? Small threw it into the river, I replied. I'll need to use Mrs. Forrester's poker. I managed to open the box with a poker. We both stared in shock. The box was empty. Not a single piece of jewelry was inside. It was a big shock. The treasure is gone, said Miss Morstan, calmly. At that moment, I felt a heavy weight lift off me. I hadn't noticed how much the treasure had bothered me until it was gone. I felt relieved. Thank God, I exclaimed. She looked at me, confused. Why do you say that? Because I can finally tell you that I love you, Mary. The treasure had been stopping me. But now that it's gone... I can tell you how I feel. That's why I say so. Then I say thank God too, she whispered, and I pulled her close. That night, I realized that even though I had lost a treasure, I had found something much more valuable. Chapter 11. The Great Agra Treasure Athelney Jones looked shocked when I got to Baker Street and showed him the hollow box. Holmes sat deep in thought in his chair while Small was sitting across from him, with his wooden leg resting over the other. Small laughed when I displayed the hollow box. This is your doing, Small, Jones said angrily. Yes, I've hidden it where you'll never find it. He announced. It's my treasure. If I can't have it, no one can. It's meant for the four of us. I've done what they would have wanted, thrown the treasure into the Thames rather than give it to relatives of Sholto or Morstan. You'll find the treasure where the key and Tonga are. I tossed it into the river when I saw you were close to catching us. It would have been easier to throw the whole box, Jones suggested. But it would have been easier for you to find then, small shot back. The treasure is scattered over miles. Small, you've made a big mistake, Jones said seriously. If you had helped the law, you might have had a better chance at your trial. Justice. Small scoffed. Who has a better right to this loot than us? Look at what we've gone through for it. Twenty years in that sick swamp, working all day, and chained at night. Always bitten by mosquitoes always ill, and mistreated by guards. I'd prefer to be hit by one of Tonga's darts than be in a prison cell while another man enjoys the money that should be mine. Holmes said calmly, we don't know your story. We can't decide if justice was on your side. Then let me tell you my story, Small said. When I was 18, I joined the army and was sent straight to India. I was barely trained when I decided to swim in the river Ganges, and a crocodile bit off my leg. I spent five months in the hospital and was sent away from the army with this wooden stump. At twenty, a man who grew indigo plants hired me to supervise his workers. The pay was decent, and I was comfortable until the rebellion started. One day, I returned from a far-off plantation to find my boss's house on fire. I managed to escape the gunfire and join a volunteer army at Agra Fort. This fort is an odd place. It has a modern part, housing our soldiers, supplies, and everything else. But the old part is a maze of empty holes and winding passages filled with scorpions and centipedes. The river protects the front, but the sides and back doors needed watching. I was assigned to watch a lonely door on the southwest side of the fort with two Sikh soldiers. One dark, rainy night, while I was on duty, I put down my musket to light my pipe. Immediately, the two Sikhs attacked me, one pointed my musket at my head, the other held a knife to my throat, threatening to kill me if I moved. I thought they were with the rebels. 
Despite the knife at my throat, I was ready to shout for help. A man held me and whispered, Don't worry. This place is safe. There are no rebels nearby. I trusted his words because of the honesty in his eyes, so I stayed quiet. The tall one, Abdullah Khan, offered me two choices, life or death. They only gave me three minutes to decide. I responded, I can't decide because I don't know what you want. But if it's against the safety of this place, I won't agree. Abdullah clarified, we want you to be rich. If you join us, we'll make sure you get a fair share of the loot. Intrigued, I asked, what is this treasure? I am ready to be rich. Abdullah then asked me to promise not to harm them or tell anyone about them. I agreed and they promised that I would get a quarter of the treasure. When I mentioned that there were only three of us, they clarified that a fourth person, Dust Akbar, would get a share as well. Abdullah explained that a very rich man from the north had hidden half his treasure in his palace and given the rest, in an iron box, to a loyal servant. This servant, disguised as a merchant, was supposed to take the box to the Agra fort until things were peaceful. Regardless of who won, either the rebels or the British East India Company, some of his treasure would be saved. Their plan was to wait for this merchant at the fort's gate and take the box. It seemed like a risky plan, but the thought of becoming rich was too tempting. One night, while it was still raining, I spotted a lantern moving towards us. Two figures, a tall Sikh and a small, round man, emerged. The small man seemed scared and ran towards us. He begged for protection and mentioned that he was carrying a few family matters in a bundle. Unable to bear talking to him, I directed the Sikhs to take him to the main guard. They marched into the dark gateway, but then there was a scuffle, and the small man tried to run away. I tripped him with my musket, and the Sikh caught and killed him. As Small told his story, his casual recounting of such cold-blooded actions horrified me. I could offer him no sympathy. Holmes and Jones shared my disgust. Small seemed to notice our reaction, but he proudly claimed that he had stayed true to his promise of dividing the treasure equally among all four of them. Unfortunately, their joy was short-lived, as they were arrested for the murder of the merchant. They were sentenced to life imprisonment, their hopes of getting the treasure dashed. While in prison, Small tried to escape but found it impossible due to the remote location. In the meantime, he observed Major Sholto and Captain Morstan losing heavily at card games. He approached Major Sholto with a plan to hand over the treasure to the government in exchange for a reduced sentence. Sholto, desperate for money, considered this. After discussing with Captain Morstan, they decided to keep the treasure for themselves and offered Small a deal. If he and his comrades were freed, they would get a fifth of the treasure. The plan was set in motion, and Small spent the entire night making maps of the Agra fort with the treasure location marked. Chapter 12 The Strange Story of Jonathan Small Small turned to us. Gentlemen, I have a long story, and Mr. Jones wants to take me to the police station quickly. So, I'll keep the end short. The bad man, Sholto, went to India and never returned. Morstan went there soon after. He found that the treasure was gone. It had been stolen. After many years, I got a chance to escape. I met a sick man from Andaman Island. I helped him. He got better after a few months. He liked me and was always near me. I learned a bit of his language, and he liked me even more. Tonga was a good sailor and had a big boat. I saw a chance to escape and made a plan with him. He brought his boat to an old pier where no one was watching. He picked me up. After eleven days at sea, a ship going to Jeddah found us. We wandered around the world for a long time. 
Four years ago, we arrived in England. I found where Sholto lived. I wanted to see if he had spent the treasure or still had it. I found out he still had the jewels. One day, I heard that Sholto was dying. I rushed to Pondicherry Lodge. I was angry because he might die before I could catch him. I saw him in bed with his sons. He died just then. That night, I went into his room. I searched his papers to find out where he had hidden our jewels. I found nothing. But I left a sign on his chest. For some years, Tonga and I just managed to live. There was no news from Pondicherry Lodge. They were still looking for the treasure. Then we heard that it had been found in a room in the attic. I knew I could not climb there because I have a wooden leg. But I knew there was a door in the roof. Tonga, who could climb well, quickly got in through the roof. Bartholomew Sholto was still in his room. Tonga killed him. I was angry at him for this. I took the treasure box and lowered it down on a rope. I left a sign on the table to show that the jewels were back with their real owners. All this is true. I believe it's the best way to defend myself. I want everyone to know how badly Major Sholto treated me. I did not kill his son. Holmes said, interesting story. A good end to a very interesting case. I did not know you brought your own rope. I thought Tonga had lost all his darts. But he managed to shoot one at us in the boat. Well, Holmes, said Jones, you heard small story. But I will feel safer when he is locked up. Thank you both for your help. Good night, said Small as they left. Our little story is over, I said after we sat quietly for a while. I think it's also the end of us living together, Holmes. Miss Morstan has agreed to marry me. So, we need to find our own home. I am nearly healed. I hope to start my own medical practice soon. Holmes groaned. I feared this, he said. I can't be happy for you. Do you have any problem with my choice? No. I think she is lovely. But love makes people emotional, and it is against reason. I will never marry. I don't want to lose my judgment. I hope my judgment will stay good. But you look tired. Yes, I'll be tired for a week. It's strange, I said, that you are sometimes lazy and sometimes full of energy. Yes, he answered, closing his eyes. I can be very lazy but also very energetic. Heard that Small had a helper in the house. It must have been the butler. Jones caught one real thief because of all his arrests. It's not fair, I said. You did all the work, I get a wife, and Jones gets the credit. What do you get? For me, said Holmes, I get the joy of solving a big mystery. The end. Have you enjoyed this story? Like and subscribe to our channel now to unlock fresh tales and level up your English skills.